The NTSB preliminary report on Dooley Vano's carbon cub crash near Twisp, Washington, early in October is out and has a lot of detailed information. And it emphasizes the importance, this crash emphasizes the importance of this critical structural part of cub type aircraft located right here where the spar attach, attaches to the fuselage right at the landing gear rear connection. Correction, the wing strut, which attaches to the wing spar, which attaches to the fuselage. Let's check it out. On these Cub type aircraft, whether it's a, the old J3 Cub like this, or a Carbon Cub, or even an Aviat Husky, the ailerons are actuated via the stick where they're connected right down here, and there's a pulley where the aileron cable turns and proceeds on up the wing strut and then goes through the wing to the top of the aileron. Then the bottom of the aileron cable goes back up into the wing and comes across the wing through this carry-through cable right here to attach to that aileron over there. If you pull, if you pull on this aileron cable, it will turn the aircraft in that same direction. For example, if I pull on this right aileron cable, it pulls the aileron up the path of least resistance, which would turn the aircraft to the right. If I pull on this left aileron cable, it again lifts the aileron up, in which case would turn the aircraft to the left. Which is a bit counterintuitive because you would think if you pull on this cable, it would just pull the stick towards you, but it doesn't. It takes the path of least resistance through the entire aileron assembly. And this strut attach point is the most critical part of the structure on these aircraft. And if you damage your gear and or damage this strut attach fitting, you can very well knock this aileron cable off of the pulley and damage the controls to the ailerons in the process. Now this was not Dooley's first accident. This was his fourth and final rodeo. Let's go inside and see what happened. Here's the recently published, well-detailed NTSB preliminary report on the crash of November 5-6 Delta Victor back on October 1st of this year, about 10.30 Pacific time. November 5-6 Delta Victor was substantially damaged when it was involved in an accident near Twisp, Washington, the pilot fatally injured on a Part 91 flight. The pilot planned to take a local flight with his friend who owned the same make and of airplane. They departed a private airfield in their respective airplanes, so they're each flying a different airplane. And this is common practice for backcountry recreational flying is uh, we'll fly together in pairs or groups of aircraft and somebody who's got experience in a particular landing spot will land there and then get, step out of his airplane, have a handheld radio with him and help guide the other pilots into the landing spot. These sort of mountaintop landings are considered a no-go-round option due to the rising terrain beyond the landing zone. And the risk versus reward needs to be assessed carefully even in something as capable as a carbon cub. They departed a private airfield in their respective airplanes and flew directly to a hillside located just two nautical miles away. The elevation of this terrain is about the 3,500 foot elevation, so considerably lower than what Dooley is used to out west here. The friend landed uphill on the slope of the hillside and positioned his airplane to the west of a tree. Using the radio, he communicated to the pilot that he should land his airplane between his airplane and the tree. Dooley made two passes over the ridge, performing reconnaissance over the landing area. The friend observed the airplane touch down on the slope further to the east of his location and land up slope. After a short landing roll, the pilot appeared to abort the landing and the airplane became airborne again. The airplane then collided with a large rock resulting in the airplane's left landing gear folding under the fuselage. So in not landing in the correct location, that put Dooley right in line with this large rock. The friend observed the airplane continue over the ridge to the east, the presumed bailout path, and he lost sight. He asked the pilot if he was okay, and the pilot replied, I'm flying, but I'm having problems. And the airplane collided with the train shortly thereafter. The airplane came to a rest 
about 1,700 feet to the northeast of the rock with an approximate 3,430 foot elevation peak between the two locations. The wreckage was found distributed over a 90 foot distance on a heading of about 250, so heading back to the west. The first identified points of contact consisted of disrupted dirt on the upslope of a hillside making up the far northeastern end of the debris field. The disruption in the train contained chips of silver paint and small pieces of fabric. Uh, the disrupted dirt widened into a crater and continued toward the wreckage with numerous vortex generators. That's the little tabs you see on the leading edge of the wing in the dirt and outboard wingtip structure. A large portion of the forward left wingtip was 25 feet from the wreckage and pieces of plexiglass and splinters of the propeller led to the wreckage. So that indicates that the impacted left wing first under power. The engine was still making full power. There were fragments of the wooden propeller surrounding the accident site and made up the farthest debris to the south. The fuselage came to rest on its left side with the right wing folded forward over the engine. The left wing sustained crushed deformation and came to rest inverted. The left forward and aft lift struts had separated but remained attached to their respective fittings on the fuselage and the wing. An approximate 1.5 foot long piece of the left aft lift strut remained attached to the airframe. The trailing edge of both portions of that strut contained black marks consistent with the rubber from the tire. So when the tire hit the rock, it came up and impacted the lift struts on the wing. The flaps appeared to be partially down and the fuel selector was in the off position. And that was probably done by the first responders responding to the accident. Both tires came to rest on or near the belly pod. So Dooley still had his, uh, the dark, the black colored carbon fiber belly pod on the aircraft and it did still have a lot of his camping material in it. The left tire was flat and showed several gouges and scrapes of the rubber and the metal hub was bent and folded over itself in one area. The landing gear struts were collapsed. The bottom of the left struts were separated and appeared to have been worn from being dragged across the terrain. The fuselage frame behind the left lift strut fork and gear strut connection fitting was deformed. The left aileron pulley located adjacent to the deformed frame would not move. The aileron cable was trapped between the frame and the pulley and could not move. Removal of the pulley hardware revealed that the pulley bracket was bent and there was evidence of the cable rubbing against the bracket and part of the airframe. The phenolic pulley had a groove for the cable that extended around the pulley, the groove contained a peak edge on each side. One side of the peak edge was fractured consistent with overstress. The cable broke out of the side of the phenolic pulley. The side face of the pulley adjacent to the fractured peak edge contained a long imprinted streak consistent to the location where the cable had pulled out and derailed from the groove. So here's the area that we're talking about where the left wing struts and landing gear rear struts all attached to the fuselage here and right above that juncture is the pulley for the aileron cable and the cable runs underneath this pulley phenolic pulley and here you, you can see where that cable well here's the pulley down here where the cable was yanked off of the pulley broke out the side of the pulley and then jammed up in this bracket the pulley bracket itself jamming the ailerons here you can see it in the jammed condition with the pulley attached. So by knocking this left gear off and jamming this pulley, that pulled the ailerons into a left turning condition and stuck there. The initial touchdown area, the, the area that he was supposed to land in, could not definitely be determined, but tracks in the dry grass were found on the slope consistent with the landing direction. A large rock was located on the saddle of the hill. There were numerous marks and scrapes found on the south rock face and on top of the rock. In the surrounding area, there was several silver chips of paint and, and a zip tie that would have been on the landing gear. These kind of landing zones are a no-go round spot. Once you get committed to these steep uphill runs, you're committed and going around is really not an option. And this rock 
that Dooley hit may very well have been hidden over, out of view as it may be located just, just enough over the top of this ridge, especially when you're coming in low, landing up that steep uphill. 24 miles away from the accident site at Omak, Washington, the weather re was reported as clear, 10 miles visibility, winds out of the north at about 11 knots and 20 degrees Celsius or about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So not a great deal of density altitude, especially at these lower elevations and lower elevations that Dooley was used to flying in out west here. So was that a contributing factor as to why Dooley considered it would be okay to do a go around because the excess performance of the carbon cub at this lower elevation would permit him to easily do a go around don't know we'll never know the answer to that dooley was an experienced private pilot back in 2009 he had an accident in his robinson helicopter uh, where it was reported the uh, that he had 4700 hours of flying time at that time 840 hours in the helicopter 30 hours last 90 days prior to the helicopter accident in this accident Dooley had taken the wife of one of the drivers of this race one of the uh, Las Vegas off-road races to go follow her husband's race car as he raced across the desert and then this happened the pilot was providing aerial surveillance of a car that was in an off-road rally race. A passenger recalled that they had just climbed over a hill and made a low banking turn to get behind the car that was in the race. This is very low altitude flying. He saw a steep cliff-like ridge ahead and was concerned about hitting it. As he cleared the ridge by about 20 feet, he heard the engine sound change pitch. The helicopter banked right and slowed down. The passenger heard the pilot say no several times as well as come on followed by the sound of a horn. The helicopter collided with the ground, touched down the skids, and the helicopter turned as if it went downhill and rolled over on its right side. The post-accident examination of the airframe and engine revealed that no anomal anomalies could have precluded normal operation. There was nothing wrong with the helicopter or the engine. The density altitude was calculated to be about 10,300 feet. Examination of the performance charts for the helicopter indicated that at the weather parameters for this flight, the power required for the maneuvers attempted exceeded the power available. Well, this accident resulted in some very serious injuries to the passengers and a massive amount of lawsuits followed that never did get completely resolved. In 2019, Dooley wrecked his first carbon cub, November 5-6 X-Ray Charlie, in a wire strike near Colorado. The pilot reported he was flying through canyons about 10 to 15 miles southwest of Grand Junction, Colorado, when the left wing struck power lines. Subsequently, the airplane impacted terrain. He added that he did not see the power line. The pilot reported that there were no pre-impact mechanical failures or malfunctions that would have precluded normal operations. And on this NTSB report, it shows that his last medical exam was August 1st of 2015. And this report was created in 2019. There was another incident with Dooley involving a Lancer Legacy turbine aircraft in Mexico, of which there is very little details. Dooley was well loved by the big tire community. We didn't know about all of these past accident histories with Dooley before this final accident. We're only lucky at this point that nobody else was injured in this final rodeo with Dooley Vano. Thank you so much for your support of this channel, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.